Hello and welcome to the Best Practices for Pain Management and Prevention of Readmissions. My name is Brandon and I'll be your operator for today. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session during which you can dial star 1 if you have a question. Please note this conference is being recorded and I will now turn it over to Tony Kepner. Tony, you may begin. Thank you, Brandon, and once again, thank you for joining us on today's webinar. My name is Tony Kettner, and I'm the nursing home project specialist, one of them, uh, in Wisconsin and part of the Lake Superior Quality Improvement Network. So um, <clears throat> what we'd like to do today is you might have, may have noticed that WebEx has a new look. And so if you're having problems joining the webinar today, if you will simply uh, type in your browser, uh, HTTPS colon backslash 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 quality net all one word dot webex dot com backslash ec that will get you to the page where you can select uh, your uh, presentation for today the best practices and you should be able then to navigate from there in terms of putting in your name and uh, email address and then the password for today. We're going to be holding all of the questions until the end, but please do feel free as you're as we're moving along, if you have questions, to put them into the chat box. And you may have to actually open the chat box and able to be, uh, um, so that you're able to see it and then be able to enter your questions. We will also be taking phone questions um, at the end of the presentation, so if you're more comfortable during, doing that, there'll be that option as well. Right before the uh, question and answer or the chat session and we start to answer questions, you will see uh, on the right side of your screen, screen a polling uh, question, and that contains the survey for today's event. So please be sure that you open that. We do appreciate any feedback for future events, and be sure that you click submit so that your um, feedback and survey uh, gets counted. So I'd like to start by introducing our three speakers for today. The first speaker is Angela Trahan, and Angela is the Director of Nursing Services from the Mennonite Home in Albany, Oregon. Chris Modell is the second speaker, and Chris is the Director of Social Services and Admissions in Dove Healthcare from Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And our third speaker is Jordan Emily, also a Director of Nursing Services at Grandview Heights Rehab and Healthcare in Marshalltown, Iowa. So without further ado, I'll pass the ball to Angela to begin the presentation. Hello. We um, have our team here with me also in case um, they want to pipe in later for questions or anything. So we started our um, project was to reduce pain using non-medication treatment. And we're a not-for-profit continuing care retirement community in Alton, Oregon. And we started in 1947 and we're skilled slash ICF facility with a population right now of about 75. We found we weren't scoring as well as we wanted to on our quality measures for pain, so we decided to try something that corrected. And this was the members of our team, a couple RPMs, a CMA, a CNA, and a LPN. So our goals were to improve the quality measures, to reduce opioid use, and to reduce pain. So additionally, we thought using an IDT team approach, it would aim to help us improve residents that suffer from pain that is chronic and is difficult to control. We conducted routine IDT meetings to formulate the project, um, developed interventions, and we continued to adjust as needed. We identified barriers to pain reduction. We modified our current pain assessment tools, and we discussed case studies on the people who were suffering from chronic pain or difficult to control. And then we developed non-pharmacological <laughs> pain programs. Oh, I got hung up. You didn't even touch it. No. Right, How do you answer it? 
Hello? You're still on the call. Okay. It's showing through that you're calling me. Can you hear me? Go ahead, Andrew. Hi. Brandon? Yes, we can hear you. You can hear me now? Okay. Yes, we can. Um, I don't know what happened there. I didn't text the phone. Um, so we developed non-pharmacological pain programs that included a variety of pain interventions that could be offered by CNAs and CMAs. We had monitoring of the non-pharmacological pain intervention effectiveness on our treatment record. So we started with residents on our short-term rehab unit, and after evaluating, we transitioned to other units. So we were looking at our pain scores through the MDS, Section J, to evaluate them as they were reported by the resident. We studied 20 rehab residents using the MDS to determine if non-medicine interventions were successful. And we began tracking in March of 2017 and ended in June of 2017. 15 of the 20 residents had a decrease in pain as reflected on the MDS. So our primary sources were therapy modalities and ice and heat packs. Our quality measure for pain in February of 2017 was 26.9, and in July we were 20%. So what we learned was we were not, we were underutilizing non-pharmacological pain interventions that were readily available to us including therapy modalities such as e-stem or diathermy. And we were also underutilizing our staff. So now we can use certified nursing aides and medication assistance to assist with non-pharmacological pain interventions. We continue to meet to, with our team to further study other residents that could benefit, and we have transitioned to our long-term care unit. And we just continue to explore other options. Thank you very much, Angela. While you're passing the ball to Chris, I'd just like to remind people that if they do have any questions, please feel free to um, document those in the chat section. And again, you may have to open that area on the right side of your screen because it may have been collapsed. And then we'll also be taking phone questions or comments uh, at the end of the um, speakers. Thank you. Chris, looks like you're ready to go. Yes, I am. Good afternoon. The Chippewa Valley Continuum of Care Coalition formed out of a strategic planning process back in 2010. The coalition was initially comprised of two hospitals, five Smiths, and a family care organization. Our focus at the time was to improve the continuum of care process as patients transition from the acute care setting to the SNF setting in a time-sensitive manner. The initial plan was to develop strategies that help minimize the number of transitions and to ensure that all transitions were seamless. We wanted to improve the well-being of our community by a collaborative process that promoted optimal patient care and services. Today, our coalition has grown to include three hospitals, hospice and home care agencies, medical clinics, family care, community-based residential facilities, and multiple SNFs. Our purpose today is to build and sustain a community coalition with a focus on improving transitions of care. We want to encourage person-centered and person-directed models of care and be able to collaborate and encourage efforts of our organizations with shared visions to advance policies that further that vision, and ultimately to reduce the number of rehospitalizations and any kind of patient care transitions. Participation in our continuum or our coalition is open to organizations and individuals that are interested in fostering the vision by actively engaging in the planning and work of our coalition. As charter members, we join in a commitment to share our best practices and our knowledge related to care transitions. We mentor our partners and providers. We all share data and support analysis related to care and transitions. 
and we promote implementation of evidence-based interventions. Some of our initial work identified gaps that impact our transitioning patients between levels of care. So for some examples, they include patients being discharged from the skilled nursing facility or to the skilled nursing facility had a higher acuity level. Some of the SNFs in the community were not prepared or able to meet those needs. We found that regulatory differences between the acute care and SNF setting uh, were obviously different. Uh, for example, the use of restraints and medications to help manage patient behaviors could occur in the acute care setting, but not allowed in the SNF setting, which then resulted in an incomplete picture of patient's state for the SNF placement. We found gaps with our root cause analysis of patients. What pieces were missing? is what we looked at. And we found a common denominator many times is that patients with behavioral health issues are the most difficult to transition. We found inconsistent and incomplete information that was shared by the acute care facilities, which impacted the ability of the receiving facility, the SNF, to make a timely decision. We found that there was a lack of education or lack of earlier education of patients and families regarding advanced care planning or long-term care planning. So once these gaps were identified, we knew we needed to put an action plan into place, and so we started looking at performance improvement opportunities. One such thing that we did is standardize the acute care referral summary of information. So what the hospital initially sent out at the referral, we wanted that standardized so that all SNFs received the same information. Likewise, we standardized the acute care discharge information. We standardized physician's plan of care, that PPOC, making sure that the MD was the one that signed the orders. The statement for being free of a communicable disease was on each of the PPOCs. We also empowered and changed the time frame that discharge summaries were being received. Initially, when we did deep dives, we found on average we were getting the discharge somebody's status post acute care discharge was taking place anywhere between 8 and 12 days before we even received the discharge summary. And then once we had this focus, we are now finding them to be much more timely, either coming at the time of admission or less than three days post discharge from the hospital setting. We had an effort with, uh, with uh, our cognitively impaired patients being accompanied um, to appointments and tests, ensuring their safety when they're outside of our buildings. We also worked on the communication be uh, between the transfer of the SNF to the clinic and the clinic back to the SNF. And in a slide that's forthcoming, you'll see what we put together as a tool. We also looked at facility capabilities. What could each of our skilled nursing facilities in our community offer and, and meet for care needs. So for example, there's some of us that have extensive, extensive wound care programs while others don't. So we wanted to make sure that the hospital settings know in advance where the capabilities lie based on the needs that they have of their patients. We also needed to um, improve upon our RN to RN handover or handoff, making sure that that discharging nurse was reporting off to the receiving skilled nurse so that the continuity of care of that patient was not compromised. So because of that, we put a script together, or we have a consistent mes message, so to speak, a protocol of what needs to be included when a nurse to a nurse give that report. So, so what you see on your um, slide now is a communication tool that we put together. Some of our facilities in our, in our community are electronically able to create their own tool utilizing this information but incorporated into, into the electronic medical record while others actually just use the paper form. This is based on the SBAR protocol. So the left side of your screen, you'll see what the skilled nursing facility completes prior to that person being transitioned out to the clinic. And on the right side of your screen, you will see what the clinic fills out upon return of that patient back to us. As many of us know, sometimes the transcription does not get back to us from a clinic appointment for several days thereafter. This is a temporary um, opportunity for them to let us know briefly what happened during that clinic visit. The next slide you're going to see is of the, um, the RN to RN handover handoff. And again, this is based off of SBAR. 
And I just wanted to show how we put the tool into electronic medical record status. So again, we're looking at situation and background. We're looking at the assessment, um, which includes the cardiac pain, respiratory. Um, we gather GI information, GU information, skin activity, and then at you know the very end is the recommendation. One of the most important things I feel is is what risk is this person at um, readmitting back to the hospital and looking at possibly those LACE scores. So based on um, the, the action plans on this uh, handover, we decided that we had more focuses that we needed to, to do in our coalition. And so we developed three different subcommittees. Um, and the first is Provider and Community Education Subcommittee. We have a Transitions of Care Subcommittee, and we have a Transportation Subcommittee. The Provider and Community Education Subcommittee identifies knowledge gaps within our community related to the types of care transitions along with opportunities for us to improve our communication and quality of care with those transitions. We provide education to healthcare providers as well as the community at large regarding healthcare resources and support along the continuum of care. The transition subcommittee monitors the transitions of care both from the hospital to the next level of care and vice versa. We focus is, or the focus is on improving the continuum of care process as patients transition. The transportation subcommittee um, compiled, or wants to compile and is working on compiling transportation resources in one place so they're all accessible to all the organizations that are in need. The collaboration is at the local and state level to ensure transportation services are available no matter the payer source or no matter the need. Some of our current action plans include where we are currently um, hosting or going to be sponsoring a medical provider event to educate the providers in our, in our current community the data related to healthcare resource utilization, how to identify and treat our community based on patient-centered goals of care for medical through the end of life care, along with the current resources that our community has to support those patient goals of care. We're also in the process of coordinating a sponsorship of a community event to educate on the need for advanced directives and having goals of care discussions. We're currently implementing a multi-directional flow of information, so from the hospital to the SNF, the clinic, the home care, and vice versa, going back. We want to make sure that, the edu that we're educating the receivers of this information as to what to do with it. So, for example, the flow of information historically has been downward, hospital to SNF, SNF to home, but we don't flow the information back. So when we look at medication reconciliation and the importance of medication reconciliation, all players that touch that particular patient need to have that information. So how do we flow that information back to where it needs to go? So we are in the process starting October 1st of flowing that information back to the clinics, the primary hospital, or the primary um, doctor, as well as the hospital settings, et cetera. Ongoing collaboration also will continue with Metastar with our focus to reduce all cause admission and readmission rates. And um, just statistically, I just wanted to share in quarter one of 2016, we, as a, as a community, we had a hospital readmission rate of 18.3%. And in quarter one of 2018, that readmission rate dropped to 16.6%. So in summary, the efforts to decrease hospital readmissions is to remove any external silos. And we must buy into the concept that the change agent requires external and internal team members. No one can do this alone. We need to be creative with a unified vision built on trust and respect. We need to work towards achieving a unified goal. We require collaboration and creativity. And most importantly, we need to stay energized as focus and focus, especially when the players of our coalition and our community change. Thanks for the opportunity of sharing our information. Thank you, Chris. There are lots of good ideas there. While you're, um, if you want to go ahead and transition then uh, the ball to Jordan, um, who will be up next. And again, um, there's some questions in chat. There's some pretty good questions. Um, I um, please feel free to to add uh, to those already there, uh, and or there'll be an opportunity to call at the end of the um, session. 
Okay, Jordan, looks like you're up. Okay, hi everybody. I am going to be presenting information um, on how we work on getting our pain four down on our Casper. Um, first, just a little bit about Grandview Heights. Um, it's been in town here since 1975. We have 109 beds, but our average census is around 95. And um, we really pride ourselves on bringing um, community members in, rehabbing them, and returning them back to their homes. We had noticed on our CASPER report that our pain score for our long-stay residents who were reporting moderate to severe pain was well above both state and national averages. So we compiled a team of myself, um, one of our MDS nurses, one of our QA nurses, our director of rehab, um, two CNAs, one of which works full-time in our dementia unit, and then one of our uh, full-time charge nurses who's an RN. So our goal was to reduce that percentage of long-stay residents reporting moderate to severe pain. Um, what we started out doing was taking the MDS pain assessment, and we would do that assessment about two weeks prior to their MDS assessment period and ask them to rate their pain. Um, in those two weeks then, we would offer different modalities to alleviate pain. Um, our focus really was not on pharmaceuticals. Um, as mentioned in the first presenter, we worked a lot on um, therapy getting involved and uh, ice, heat, warm blankets, that kind of thing. Um, and then we also offered, we found what's called a comparative pain scale. And I'll go into that here in a minute. To use that with residents who are able to use it. And then we also spoke um, specifically to our aide that was on the team who worked on our dementia unit. And we talked to her about recognizing um, signs and symptoms and pain of pain in our residents with advanced dementia. So, I realized I did not send a copy of the comparative pain scale um, to be included in our slide, so I apologize for that. But um, so I'm going to talk about that just very briefly. The comparative pain scale was a tool that we found, and basically what how it works is for those residents who are able, um, we all know we go in, we say, can you rate your pain with zero being no pain, 10 being the worst pain imaginable, and they give us a number. Let's say they give us a five. So on the comparative pain scale, then it describes what a five is. Um, so for example, that would be moderate pain, strong deep piercing pain, such as a strained ankle, when you stand on it wrong, or mild back pain. Not only do you notice the pain all the time, you're now so preoccupied with managing it that your normal lifestyle is curtailed. Temporary personality disorders are frequent. What we found was oftentimes with that comparative pain scale, um, the person may have told you their pain was a, a five, and after you describe it to them, they say, oh, no, it's not nearly that bad. So. That was the main tool that we used. So back to the slide here. So we mainly looked at our CASPER report. Um, when we began, our state percentage was 6.7%, national was 5.6%, and our facility percentage was 12.2%. So we were at least double um, some of those percentages. Now our latest numbers, which I don't have the most recent because we currently cannot access our CASPER, um, the state is 7.6, the national is 6.3, and the facility is 3.7. So you can see that we um, definitely we met our goal 
um, so as a, a quick result, um, our goal was to decrease our percentage from 12.2 percent to eight. Um, and after our initiating our program, uh, the very first time we we checked our Casper after we started using this comparative pain scale, it actually dropped to 5.3 percent, and it hovers right around the 3.7 percent mark. Um, one key lesson that we learned from this was that people do not accurately report their level of pain. We know as nurses we're taught pain is what the person says it is, um, but we also know that we've all seen those folks who report their pain as terrible and it's a 10 out of a 10, yet they continue to um, go through all their ADLs and, and their normal um, activities without the pain really interfering. So we really had to figure out a way to try to get an accurate number. So education was key, and that's really where that comparative pain scale came into play. So the second, I feel, um, lesson that we learned, too, also was, again, not focusing necessarily on pharmacological interventions, but instead on therapy and education. We all know there's going to be those instances where we're going to have to give some sort of pharmacological intervention, but we like to try other things first. So now we include that comparative pain scale in our everyday pain assessment with those residents who are able to use it. We've continued to also use it um, on the MDS, and I feel like that is really what has continued to keep our numbers down in that range that we've wanted it to. And that's it. Thank you, Jordan. Do you want to go ahead um, and pass the ball back to me? And then at this time, we'll uh, open it up. Uh, Brandon, if you want to explain to folks how they can call in with their questions. Looks like we do have a question, at least for each person in chat already. Uh, again, these are some really excellent uh, ideas that people have generated and worked on. So uh, please feel free to ask them questions um, and provide comments. Brandon? Thank you. We'll now begin the question and answer session. If you have a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you'd like to be removed from the queue, please press the pound sign or the hash key. If you're on a speakerphone, please pick up your handset first before dialing the numbers. Once again, if you have a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Okay, you're standing by for questions. We have none so far on the phone. This is Leah in the chat, and I'll read some of the questions that we have in uh, the chat at the moment. So I believe this was initially for Angela's team. So what interventions do the CMA and CNAs do besides repositioning and ice or heat? Hi, this is Tanya. I'm one of the nurses here and one of the care managers, and I can address that question. So the CNAs and the CMAs are working with basically a cart that we created and put products in, um, things like earplugs, eye masks. We have uh, CD players available with relaxing music. Um, and all this is an attempt at obviously relaxation, reducing anxiety that may be related to this pain. The other option that we came up with is offering snacks or drinks as a distractive measure. Um, also, closing the curtains, checking to see if the temperature in the room was appropriate for them. Maybe they're a little anxious because it's cold or warm. Those are a couple of the other thoughts that we had in regards to that. Thank you very much. Anyone else on your team? Yeah, I, I just, this is Lacey. I'm another care manager here. Um, you know, we did offer all those other things, but we did find that really the most successful non-pharmacologic intervention is heat and ice. Um, so, you know, one of the snags was we, we had to buy a lot more heat and ice packs. And so if you're considering launching this program, I would really have those readily available because it did make a pretty drastic difference in people's pain. 
And I know that some people are afraid that there might be burns. Can you address how you um, address that? So what we did is we had to create a policy for that particular um, that worry that we had um, that there was an instruction pamphlet that's included with those the heat packs that we have, and of course we tested it out beforehand with the knowledge that um, elderly people have thinner skin, maybe a greater risk for burns. Um, and when it was placed on the particular resident, if the instructions included not facing it directly onto the skin, et cetera. And then the nurse was required after a certain period of time to go back and double check and make sure that the temperature was still appropriate. Um, and again, like Jordan had said, it, it was about education and educating our CNAs to understand all of these things and to, to properly heat and, uh, and apply and then the follow-up with the nurses. This is Jordan. I would agree. Um, the ice and the heat. Now, we don't have heat packs, we, but we do have blanket warmers, and we keep warm blankets in them all the time. That obviously doesn't get as warm as a warm pack, um, but those are very beneficial. And, yes, the CNAs can uh, do that with the follow-up with the nurse. Hey, I'm getting, you know, so-and-so an ice pack. They're complaining of X pain. Uh, I just actually had an aide in my office yesterday who had gone to get an ice pack for someone who was complaining of hip pain. Um, so, yeah, the, the ice and the heat, I definitely agree with those being very effective. And the, the gel packs are really, really good because they last longer. The, the heat, um, and they stay hot longer than a warm blanket. So it's more effective. It's more, it's a little bit longer term than just a warm blanket. Yep. Thank you very much. All right. Are there any phone questions? Uh, at this time, we have none. Okay. Uh, this question is for Chris. What interventions did you implement to ease or improve the transition of persons with behavioral expression? I wish I had something magical to say um, with that particular question. It's a great Great question. I still feel that there's a lot of room for um, us in, in this industry to um, to improve upon. There's no magic pill. Um, you know, we're under regulatory surveillance, you know, in terms of the type of patients that we bring in and the need to protect those that are already in our buildings. Um, so it's very challenging. But one thing that I feel that we that we do do is making sure are we looking at what is truly the root cause of that behavior? Is it pain-related? Because many times it is pain-related, and if we can get the pain under control, um, we might have a better outcome. But unfortunately, our, our work group hasn't, um, has not really done a deeper dive into coming up with other solutions um, in terms of how do we make that ease better. So I wish I had a magical answer for you, but I don't. In regards to the um, as a form, if, if if that's something that anybody else wants, I certainly am more than willing to share that information. Um, so I can get you a copy if you just if you have my email on the slide. So feel free to um, contact me via email, and I can send that out to you. Thank you. Are there any additional questions on the phone? Or anyone? At this time. No questions on the phone. Once again, if you have a question on the phone, please press star 1. And we do have a question on the phone from Michelle Chance. Please go ahead. Hi. I put it in chat, but I guess my main question would be towards Chris from Dove. You mentioned, of course, that you guys have that subcommittee on transportation and try to make it to where, you know, transportation can be arranged no matter PE or need, and I know in New Mexico, of course, sometimes if you're talking rural New Mexico and don't have Medicaid, that can be a huge gap in resources and medical care. How do you guys work that if the person, you know, if it's just straight based on need, but this person doesn't have Medicaid? 
our focus right now has primarily been on um, meeting the financial need of patients because in our state in Wisconsin right now, um, Medicaid, if you are a skilled nursing facility resident and on Medicaid, our local providers, which we have a number of them, they are capping off how many Medicaid patients that they will be willing to transport. So we're running into more of the other end where we it's based on payer, um, where we're running into the payer issues versus the availability. I can tell you, though, that our aging disability resource centers in our communities have been very helpful, um, helping us kind of navigate some of those complicated cases like that um, where, you know, unfortunately, and, or, or fortunately or unfortunately in my community, we don't have a lot of, of rural setting. We have rural setting, but I'm assuming in terms of your comparison with New Mexico, um, we're talking apples and oranges in terms of what is considered rural for me versus rural for you. Um, but we do tap into a lot of our other resources that are in our community, such as the ADRCs, um, or it might be well known in some other, or other areas like the Department of Aging, um, places like that to help us problem solve. Okay, thanks. And we have Carol Engel with her mind. Please go ahead. My question I did also put in chat, but it's a little easier just to speak of it. It is the um, coding of pain on the MDS. We consistently code um, above nas national and state average on short stay and long stay pain both. And um, I had asked the MDS coordinator to also go and ask, and I did it a month prior just because if we did change anything, I wanted enough time to make it work, just to ask the person the, the pain question and then um, ask them what we could do to make their pain better because, quite frankly, a lot of our folks are kind of chronic pain med seekers. And I believe that they are so afraid that if they have their pain managed and they say that out loud, we'll take some away. So that's kind of what our goal was. But um, she said that she gave it a balanced effort. We still flag. They all still say they have terrible pain. Um, and it's very obvious that they aren't having that kind of pain. But when you say that you're using... Um, a comparative pain tool to say, well, you say you're having a seven. This is a um, the definition of a seven pain that that would maybe be trying to get them to sway their answer. And we've understood that you cannot do that. You have to ask the questions exactly as scripted, and you can't try to change their mind. Am I incorrect? Um, I guess I. We've been doing it this way for almost a year. Well, I've um, seen that you guys went from above average to now you're lower than state and national average. You know, because truly we talk about this as a you know a care team. We can oh, yeah. certainly see these people aren't having sevens. They're oh, out know. doing normal things. They're giggling, laughing, um, attending activities. But consistently when they're asked, what their level of pain is, they'll stop laughing long enough to say a seven. And the training, I used to be an MDS coordinator, and I know the training always said, if they say it's a seven, it's a seven. It doesn't make a difference what you think. So, well, we, of course, I'm going to try this comparative tool if it's going to get sent to us. And right. we will try to read that and see. But I'm kind of afraid that um, the state surveyors, would say that is trying to sway your numbers? Well, I can tell you that um, we had survey in June and they looked at this and did not voice any concern at all. Okay, good. Well, that's very good to hear because we need to do something. We have kind of tipped this in our coffee and um, with no, no improvement in any, any of our scores, we've tried a couple different routes. Yes, um, I know we've we had many lengthy conversations about it before. This is what we came up with. Um, but yeah, I what I can tell you is that the surveyors we had in our building <laughs> did not have any right. any issue at all with it. So, and I mean they you know of course I had all the information for them and they had it to look at at their discretion and 
Um, there was nothing, no, nothing mentioned at all, no concerns. Well, I really hope that, you know, we can do that because we would not allow our people to be in pain. Um, no, as soon as we no. feel that they are managed, then we don't try any harder because we would not allow them to be in pain, but we know that their pain is managed, but yet they are almost afraid to say it's managed. I, that's just what we kind of think it is. Yep, yep, and I don't disagree at all. And I think with the comparative pain scale, you know, you may say, you know, maybe they say it's a 7 and you say, okay, this is how a 7 is described. They still may not change it. Um, but but what we find is a lot of a lot of the times once you describe it to them, then they will say, Oh well, no, it's not that bad at all, and they'll, you know, they'll change it. Yeah. Well, and I always, I always, you know, think maybe we should prelude it with saying, you know, we are so glad if your pain is managed, just know that we won't take away meds. But we're not right. supposed to say that either. But I would sure like to. You know, just our goal is that you're comfortable, and we hope you are. But then yeah. maybe they're seeking for more pain meds too. I just don't know. I know it's a tough spot, and especially now with the opioid crisis, we're been dealing with a lot of that too. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Okay. And we have Nancy Van Dam online. Please go ahead. Hi, I was just um, saying that I was going to say we do the education to the patients before we go ahead and do the pain assessment that we're going to put on the MDS. So we go through what they're on now as far as pain control and what, you know, is this working? Is it a tolerable level? Is it affecting your – and we try to teach them to look at their goals and, and what we're doing, and then we say, okay, now I need to ask you these interview questions. So it's not part of the questioning itself. It's part of education prior to, if that's helpful to anybody. So I don't really have a question, and thank you for sharing the comparative pain scale. I guess I do have a question, because it's divided into three sections, and there's, of course, four choices on the MDS, mild, moderate, severe, or horrible. Right. So that doesn't quite match there, but we also, use a, we also use a Pritchett pain scale at ours. Pritchett Hall, I think, is the people who put that one out that has faces, numbers, and descriptions on a little chart that the resident can pick from. And that quite often will help too. A five is pain too bad to ignore for long. Um, a nine is I cry out in pain and a 10 is passed out. Right. So it, it's, it's an easier one, but sure. still I don't know where the numbers would fit if they can't give me a number and they just point to a face then I'll put in the number of that face. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. All right, once again, if you have a question or comment, please dial star one. And standing by for anything further. This is Leah, and one of the chat questions is directed to those um, who did the pain presentation, so either Angela or uh, Jordan's team. Have any of you used weighted blankets for pain relief? This is Jordan. I have not, but I have con I. It has crossed my mind several times, not only for pain relief, but also I've often wondered for um, folks with anxiety. There's a lot of research out there that supports the use. They kind of started out being used for kids um, on the autism spectrum, and now they're finding other uses for them in the geriatric population. So, no, I have not, but I have considered it. And this is Tanya with Angela's team. We have not used them either. Um, if anybody has any information on them, that would be great. It'd be something I'd be interested in researching. And yeah, we have Janelle Carr on the line. Please go ahead. Um, as far as the weighted blankets, we did have a facility that had looked into it for anxiety for the a resident. Um, 
one of the comments that came from a surveyor that was in the building, they had asked questions about that, and they were instructed to look at that and look at her ability to remove the blanket if she was sitting, because it could be considered a restraint. So just to make sure that the resident is able to move the blanket and knows that she can lift the blanket. That came from a surveyor and that was in the state of New Mexico. And that was just a comment on that with the weighted blanket. Thank you. Okay, nothing further on the phone is it? This is Tony. I just wanted to remind people that the um, polling questions have come up, the survey questions, so um, we would appreciate greatly if uh, when you get an opportunity you could fill those out and then do make sure that um, you're, you uh, click on the submit button. Thank you. Did I see some additional questions in the chat box? If I missed something, please type up. I don't think okay. I got everything. Oh, um, uh, there was a question about the CNAs having conversations about pain with the residents or if it's just a, a licensed nurse. And that could be either uh, it, it, both Angela and uh, Jordan that could speak to that. Hi, this is Lacey from Angela's team. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay. So our CNAs do not assess pain. They are able to report it to the nurse who does a, a, a thorough pain assessment. But, um, I mean, if, if a resident's saying they're uncomfortable, then they can still offer the intervention, but they, they do need to notify the nurse so the nurse can assess the pain. Yeah, this is Jordan. That's the same, same thing with us, of course, because we know CNAs, um, it's not in their scope of practice to assess, but they can certainly offer um, the ice or the warm blanket or warm package, depending on your facility. Um, and then, yes, the follow-up would need to be done with the nurse. Thank you both. Uh, there's also um, another uh, question about sharing more non-pharmacological ideas for pain control. I guess I would just ask, have either, either of you tried um, aromatherapy at all as a, a, an alternative? So we actually explored this a little bit, and some of, the, some of the problems we came across is, of course, you're going to have to create a policy. You're going to have to speak with your, you know, whoever your doc is there and make sure that he's on board with that. There is no, we could find no, what's the word I'm looking for, Lacey? Um, yeah, I, I mean, we found evidence that it was, that it could be helpful, but we couldn't find any, any standards as to what the legalities on some of these things are. So we had, we had kind of uh, put that on the back burner as something that, that might be a potential option in the future, but we need to do some more research on it. Right. Which is sad because it was actually the driving force for right. this project, and we haven't been able to get it running yet. Right. But it was a thought process, and we had some good ideas, but they did not come to fruition as of yet. We haven't. We have not tried aromatherapy, no. Do, do either of you have any other non-pharmacological interventions that you found particularly helpful? Um, do either of you have like a music uh, a music program? I know that you have the music in memory, but have you found music to be helpful in terms of reducing pain? So I, I at times have found that it's, it's not necessarily a pain reducer, but maybe a, an anxiety reducer, uh, which may in turn help with the pain. Our activities department does have um, several CD players as well as relaxing CDs that are available and the CNAs are aware they're available um, for the residents should, should we think that would benefit them. So 
other than that, like we had said previously, the big thing that we found, and I noticed a question a little further up and it asked about the gel packs, what do we use for a heat pack? There's an actual gel pack that you can purchase. Our central supply purchased it online, and I'm sure any of your central supplies could get it. And I want to say it was there was about six gel packs in the box, and, and it was between $120 and $150, I believe, approximating. So they're not cheap. Um, but they work really, really well, and we heated them in the microwave, and they do, like I said, come with instructions. They weren't something – the biggest problem we have is, is keeping track of them. We we are primarily SNF over here, Lacey and I are, and people go home. They come and go quickly, and when they leave, they really like those gel packs, and the gel packs tend to go with the residents. So that's, that was one of the biggest – uh, problems we've had so far is having to purchase them again because they do really work. They work well. Jordan, do you have anything to add to the discussion? The only thing, the only other thing I was thinking of, and it's not technically it would not be non-pharmacological, but, you know, something like biofreeze or a muscle rub, obviously those are things that un you know, a nurse or a med is going to have to apply, but um, those those are good interventions to use also um, in lieu of, you know, an oral medication. So therapy was our biggest friend, um, getting them into therapy, getting, you know, some range of motion. We've got an ultrasound machine um, that that was very, very beneficial. Great. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. This is Leah. There are some questions trickling into chat. Uh, someone asked about heating pads in the microwave. They're under the impression that that's not um, something that you should be doing. Does someone want to comment on that? Well, it's not a heating pad. It's a gel pack. And they're designed specifically to be heated in the microwave. The instructions even give you those. That is the instructions. It gives you a timing instruction as far as the length of time. You turn it over. And, the, and again, we're back to the CNA education that once that is heated, um, you have to watch for hot spots, those kinds of things, because the gel has to be moved around inside that bag so it's of equal temperature and you're not receiving any hot spots, and then the follow-up with the RN as well. So it's not really what I would call a heating pad. It's, it's actually a, it's probably, I would say, 16 inches by, oh, maybe 12 inches. It's a large blue and clear gel pack is what it is. So the CNA is actually tint it with a thermometer? No, there's no, there's not a way to tint it with a thermometer. Um, it was primarily, we tested it out using um, different times. It, the temp that's actually on the, or the time frame that's on the instructions, we all felt was a little too long and was a little too hot. So we've actually reduced the amount of time um, that, it, that we heat it for just in, in the, with the concerns that we, we were worried about burning people. And that was, you know, that was kind of a, a little bit of a process, figuring out exactly what we needed to do and the length of time to heat it for for an appropriate temperature. Thank you. There's also some comments regarding the aromatherapy, and Rebecca comments that there is some information on the CMS website that discourages the use. Um, I believe uh, there's a question in the chat about a completion certificate. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe once you complete the survey, you get a certificate of completion. Is that correct? I believe that's correct. So complete the survey at the end, and if you haven't received a, um, any sort of confirmation in the next week, please email your QIO, and we'll get that to you. And then um, in the, 
handout section, there are some flyers. There is a series, six series on opioid um, prescribing and safety, uh, and so please check that out for the series of six webinars on opioid safety. Okay, I'd like to thank uh, the participants for joining us today and the three speakers. It's been a wonderful uh, afternoon hearing all of the kinds of good work that you're doing in terms of uh, helping uh, residents uh, in your homes and um, using performance improvement uh, to move those efforts forward. So given that there are no further questions, I think that uh, we'll close this session. And again, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's conference. Thank you for joining. You may now disconnect. Speakers, please stand by for your...